shake hands with a neighbor and tell them God is awesome. your moves. <laughs> uh, if you would, please take a moment to fill out the welcome blue card and let us know that you're here in a prayer request. We do have a new baby in our church family. Uh, Brian and Katie had uh, Charles Benz this past Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, named after Charles Elliott. So uh, I tell you, when they name kids after you, you are extra, extra special. So uh, we rejoice with their family. Um, two of her folk were in the hospital, now home, Dave Kelly and uh, Debbie Kaufman, recovering from surgery, and we're grateful for that. Let's pray together, and then we'll study. Father, thank you that we get to meet you in your word, and you're a God who speaks. So this day, we desire to hear your voice. May your Holy Spirit take the truth and plant it firmly in a welcoming and humble heart. We are grateful, God, for the birth of little Charlie and ask your blessings upon him and uh, Brian and Katie and Clara. Uh, God, strengthen that precious family and thank you that Katie is doing well. We entrust Brother Dave Kelly and Debbie Kaufman to you, God particularly. We thank you for blessing our church family in every way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you turn to Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 16, here's a verse that you should have memorized when you were 12 years old and probably memorized it too late in life. But we're going to be dealing with finances this Lord's Day and next Lord's Day from the perspective of Proverbs. And here is one that's worthy of committing to heart. Let's read it together, either in your text or from the screen. Let's read. Of what use is money in the hand of a fool since he has no desire to get wisdom. Read it again. Of what use is money in the hand of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? In other words, he won't use it appropriately. That's the definition of a fool, is one who is... So, hey, guys. Oh, knock him in the head behind you. Landon, look at me, please. Okay? Um, now, you, you, I have messed myself up. The definition of a fool is a self-centered person. He is locked into himself. He resists instruction and he resists correction. Why? Because he knows it all. I should have Dean come up and tell that story of years ago with your van with the magic windows when your boys thought that they knew it all. And so Solomon would protect us from that. In chapter 12 and chapter 14, he twice has, the, chapter 14 and chapter 16, this line, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And that death ultimately is separation from God, but you know, to be foolish with one's money will lead to financial death as well. And Solomon, in writing the Proverbs, desires that we'd walk with God. That's why one of the central passages is in chapter 3, when he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil, for this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. That is His desire. And this Lord's Day and next we'll look at His counsel with respect to handling finances. Solomon's desire is that we trust and honor God with our finances. His desire is that we would enjoy God's blessing in the material aspect of our lives. And His desire is that we would handle appropriately and wisely everything that God has entrusted to us. And so four quick lessons this morning. The first one is this, to answer the question, what trumps wealth? 
And there are several mentioned in Proverbs. We're going to look briefly at three. The first one is Solomon says that wisdom surpasses wealth. Look in chapter 3, if you would, or it's going to be on the screen. And we're going to read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Let's read aloud together, please. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. The song that we sang earlier takes that verse and applies it more appropriately to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Solomon says, wisdom surpasses wealth. It's because she brings an abundance of gifts. In the second chapter, we saw this last Lord's Day, wisdom brings to us the protection of God. He becomes our shield. Wisdom instructs us to be morally sharp and obedient, discerning what is right and what is wrong. Wisdom, he says, will product, protect us from those who would lead us astray, from those who are evil. In the third chapter, he says that wisdom will produce prosperity. Wisdom will produce a long life. If there's anything that we can get, Solomon says, get wisdom. It will bless you for a lifetime. But there's more than simply wisdom that surpasses wealth. Solomon says that a friend who speaks the truth surpasses wealth. Look at chapter 12 of Proverbs, if you would. Proverbs in chapter 12, and we're going to read verse 25 in just a moment. Another passage that relates this in chapter 20, it's in the outline. Gold there is and rubies in abundance, but lips that speak knowledge are a rare jewel. You know, sometimes in your life, there's a need for someone to come alongside and speak encouragement. Uh, a number of months ago, uh, I think sometimes I go from depression to ecstasy. I am not bipolar, but that seems to be characteristic of me at times. In a particularly low moment, I'd gotten a phone call from a friend in North Carolina just to ask me how I was doing. And it so touched me, it almost made me cry on the phone, which I rarely do, but I was glad to hang up afterwards, and I thought, the right call at the right moment. And Solomon uses such language in chapter 12 and verse 25. Let's read it. An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. There are times when we simply need someone to come alongside. We don't need a kick in the rear end. We need an arm around the shoulder. And wisdom, Solomon says, or what surpasses wealth, is a wise friend who knows the appropriate word at the right time who comes alongside and speaks an encouragement and strengthens us. But then there are other times that we really do need a kick in the bottom. And Solomon addresses that as well. In chapter 24, in verse 26, if you turn there, or again, it's going to be on the screen. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 26. Let's read that aloud together. An honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. And I'd like you to listen to one other from Proverbs chapter 27 and verses 5 and 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. There are times someone needs to come to us and say, What are you doing? Or to say, you are wrong. Your words were inappropriate and unfitting. And there's a need, Solomon says, and such a friend surpasses the value of wealth simply to have a friend who speaks to us in that way. And the question that it begs is, in your life, who has the authority or right to speak the truth to you? Who is it that can address you openly, eye to eye, and say, you're wrong, or give counsel to you, and you will listen to? If there is no one, there's the danger of being a fool. And it's not simply the someone who has the right to speak to us that way, it's also our response to that. Some of us, by nature, I tend to be one, that when rebuked, it's like taking sandpaper and rubbing it across my flesh. 
Because it hurts, I chafe easily. Solomon simply says, what I need more than anything is to respond rightly to the one who corrects me. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. An honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. So, beloved, when one comes to me or comes to you in an earnest desire to speak openly the truth of God and the truth stings, Solomon says, praise God, you are a rich man. Such a friend makes you more, much better off than the person who is wealthy. So Solomon says, here are two things that trump wealth. One of them is wisdom. The other is a friend. And then thirdly, he mentions a good name. This is in Proverbs 22.1. It's not the only place, but we're going to read this text aloud together. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1. Let's read it aloud. It's like Bible drill all in Proverbs, which makes it so much easier. 22 verse 1, let's read. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. A good name, there are two ways to get a good name, but only one will last. Many of us inherited a good name from our parents. You know, particularly if you had the privilege of growing up in a community where folk knew your mom and dad, and you are blessed by being their son or being their daughter. Your dad or mom is a hard worker, and automatically it's assumed that you're going to be like them as well. Your mother and father were particularly generous, and you inherit that good name. You're going to be like them. But that only lasts so long until people get to know us. And Solomon says that a good name or a good reputation is earned by a righteous life. I'm going to read a couple of texts. These are not going to be on the screen. But in Proverbs in chapter 10, and parts of them are in the outline, in Proverbs in chapter 10 and verse 7, if you've turned there, we're going to read that aloud together. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7. Let's read it. The memory of the righteous will be a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. And then over in Proverbs chapter 11, verses 10 and 11. Let's read together. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. Beloved, I'd urge you to read through chapters 10, 11, and 12 and have a highlighter and mark every reference to being upright, righteous, or righteousness. That's how a good name is earned. It is not earned by wealth. It is not earned by being deceitful. It is not earned by being sly. It is earned simply by a righteous life that conforms to the will of God. Last evening... Matt and I were watching Jeopardy at 7 o'clock on ABC. And it was interesting, in the first round of Jeopardy, one of the categories was the Ten Commandments. And they do that on occasion. But often when they use the Bible, sometimes they use little trick questions. They didn't for the Ten Commandments. They just went down through the Ten Commandments. The first one was, you live a long life if you honor what is father and mother. And then without a snicker in the audience or from the contestants, uh, the seventh commandment was identified. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And the last one was a, a commandment relative to lying. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And there it was on international television for all the world to see. There is a moral law. There is truth. And Solomon says, you and I earn a good name by walking in wisdom, by walking in truth. And a good name surpasses the wealth of wealth. So what trumps or surpasses wealth? Solomon says at least three things. Wisdom does. A friend who speaks the truth to us. And thirdly, a good name. Then if you'd look in Proverbs in chapter 3, he does address specifically this matter of the handling of wealth. Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to read aloud verse 5 down through verse 10. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, the last two address issues of wealth. Let's read together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now look particularly at verses 9 and 10. It is interesting that the instruction is to trust the Lord, to shun evil and fear Him. And the first example that He gives is, honor the Lord with your wealth. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus would say amen because he talked about money more than he did any other subject. And Solomon, when he makes an application of trusting the Lord, his first application in this chapter is to honoring the Lord with our wealth. Think for a moment, the, the word honor means to express respect or regard to a person for a couple of reasons. One, because of status. You honor your father and mother. Why? Because of their status. They gave us life. Therefore, we honor or value or regard them highly. And the other reason that we honor people is because of accomplishment. Accomplishment. You know, in your work environment, it doesn't matter where you are on the structure of leadership or employment, but if you come up with an idea that revolutionizes your company or are particularly successful, often an honor is bestowed. You're not promoted, you are simply honored because of what you've done. And Solomon says to us, God is to be honored for both reasons. Because first of all, of who He is. In Psalm 24, King David says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. His status is that He is God. And there is none other. And we sang choruses and Gene reminded us this morning, You alone are worthy. You alone are God. And so in giving, we're expressing honor to God. It is more than paying bills. It is more than accepting responsibility. It is more than expecting the blessing of God. It is an expression of honor to God because of His status, but it's also honoring God because of what He has done. And His greatest work in Scripture is our salvation. This is incredible to consider that before the creation of the world, He had determined to rescue us in Christ. And the glory of God is revealed there on the cross in His death and resurrection as no other place. Because of that, Solomon says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits from the beginning, from the best, from the first fruits of your crops. But then he adds to that a promise. The honor is what we express to God. The promise is what we receive from God. We read it there, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. And he's not talking about, you know, I cannot conceive of being a, worth a million dollars, or ten million dollars, or fifty million dollars, or fifty-five million dollars, like the wealthiest people in the world. But Solomon is not talking about those who are filthy rich. When he used the term barns and vats, he's talking about grain and grapes, <laughs> the staples of life. And Solomon says that when we honor the Lord with the first fruits of our, uh, of our, of our wealth, with our crops, and we go to a cupboard and open it, I, I know this, I could go to any one of your homes and find something to eat today. Anybody need some help? And we'll do it. But isn't that true? We, I could probably go to any of your homes, open the cupboard, open the refrigerator, and there would be enough for lunch. There would probably be enough for supper. There would probably be enough for Monday. There would probably be enough for Tuesday. And then somebody's going to go shopping. That's what he's talking about, grains and grapes, the essentials of life. I uh, recently got to hear our daughter's uh, preacher out there in California, and he had been to Ecuador, and he spoke to his folk this encouragement. He said, when you and I opened a closet this morning, we had to choose what we were going to wear today. 
where I've just flown back from, it wasn't a question of making a choice. You wore what you had on. That's grain and grapes. All the necessities are the assurances that Solomon gives to us because as we honor the living God, we receive a promise from God, I will meet your needs. It's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 when he said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That says nothing about a television or cable or the size of the TV. It says nothing about the multiple cars that someone might have available. It has nothing to do with square footage. It has everything to do with grain and grapes. With the necessities of life being generously supplied by God. He is honored and we accept a promise every time the plate is passed or any time we make a gift that's outside of that to assist someone. We experience an opportunity to honor God and we experience the promise of God. Then very, very quickly, turn to chapter 10, if you would, please. The third lesson that's at the foundation of finances in Proverbs, not simply that there's something that trumps wealth, and not only that giving is associated with honor and promise, but it is that you and I are stewards. In chapter 10, verse 22, let's read it aloud together. That's right, just a minute, they're still turning, that's good. I can just tell you, loads of places. This is especially true of eastern North Carolina. Um, those folk do not carry Bibles to church. Or if they bring them, they don't open them. And I've done revival after revival in those areas. And, and if I were to say, turn your Bibles and let's read together, you know who reads? Pat and I. So I just stop asking the question after a while. <laughs> and it's such a delight You know, I know we can read from the screen, and that's wonderful, but to hear those pages flipping is good. Chapter 10, verse 22. Let's read together. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Read that again, please. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Wealth originates with God, who is generous with us, and you and I are stewards. That is, we are entrusted with that wealth to use it appropriately. Think of when your parents taught you to be a steward without ever using the word. When, in working from this text of Scripture, two stories came from my mind out of childhood. The first one, I was probably eight or nine years old. My mother worked part-time as a waitress in a restaurant down at Bethany Beach during the summer months, and so my dad was no cook. And so it was crackers and milk was a regular fare or something that mom had prepared for the, for the evening meal. But after supper, once or twice per week, my dad would drive us to the Tasty Freeze. Three boys sitting in the back of the truck. And for some reason, my dad's sitting by himself up in the cab. He may have wanted us all to suffer together in the back. I don't know. But he'd always drive us to the Tasty Freeze. And this was always the same instruction. He'd say, boys, I want you to go in, get me a pint of ice cream. Don't get it from the cooler. Make certain they take it from the machine." Now, why was that? Because that, when they take it from the machine, they always give the curly cue on top so you're not cheated. And he wanted it fresh. He wanted it from the machine. Always the same thing. Then he'd say, and you buy, boys, each of you buy an ice cream cone for yourselves. And so that's what we would do week after week, go into the Tasty Freeze, buy my dad a pint of ice cream, and then we'd come out with our ice cream cones. What was he teaching us? He never used the word and he never even thought about it. But what he was teaching us was be a steward. Whose money were we handling? His money. I can tell you if we'd come out holding a Coke and a cone and handed him a cone, it would not have gone very far. We would have walked those three miles back to our house just to learn the lesson. We were stewards entrusted with his money. The other lesson that sprang to mind is my precious mother Every Sunday morning, and when she stopped doing this during our years, it must have been when I got to be a teenager at at some point. But I remember as a child, this would go long before being 10 years old to being five or six, seeing her sit down at our family desk with her ledger open every Sunday morning making financial entries. And beside each of our names, there was 25 cents marked. And she'd hand each of us three boys a quarter. And then my mom and my dad, we three boys, would all go to church together. And you know what? I never kept the quarter in my pocket. 
the quarter always ended up in the offering plate in Sunday school. Why? Because it wasn't mine to handle. We only lived a quarter of a mile from a neat country store where you could still buy a soda for 10 cents and buy a candy bar for a nickel and some of those wax kisses or cigarettes that were candy for just about nothing. But I don't even ever be tempted to keep the quarter in my pocket until Monday morning. And the lesson was the word was never used. You are a steward, but the lesson was plain. This is not yours. And that's stewardship. This is not mine. It comes from God. It comes from God. And we don't have time to explore it, but it's there in the outline. Part of stewardship is not simply giving and offering. It's maintaining what we already have. Solomon's going to say in chapter 24, it's the wise man who knows the condition of his flocks because they provide wool for him for clothing, and they provide meat for his family. He maintains what he has. So you know, there is this sense that when you have your oil changed, either you change it yourself or you hire someone else, that is as sacred as your tithe to Jesus. And, and that's, that's what worship is, a desire to honor Jesus with it all. When you make an effort, and we don't all have to look the same. You know, it's true. Some of us are just by nature going to be bigger than other people are. And some folk are going to be skinny and a whole bunch in between. But you know what? Every time that a person is careful in the maintenance of his body, that is as sacred as the offering that he makes on the Lord's day. That when a person has a leak in his roof, and he either climbs the roof to repair it, or he hires someone to come repair it for him so that his home will not be damaged, that is as sacred in the eyes of God as making a contribution to a missionary. Why? Because it's not mine. It's his. It's his. And we are stewards to maintain what God's entrusted to us. So as you read through the wealth of the book of Proverbs, you discover so much that our relationship with God involves not simply what we do when we have assembled together, but wisdom allows us to enjoy fellowship with God in every aspect of life. That wisdom calls us to rejoice in the instruction of God that fits into our marriage, into our family life, into our work life, into our business life, into our play life, into our worship life, whatever it is. It's brought before the living God. Why? Because you and I are stewards. We are entrusted by God with all that we have. Now, doesn't mean I'll never throw something away. You know... Pat and I cleaned out our garage yesterday, and uh, there wasn't much of a treasure there, but at least we have a clear floor until someone asks if they can store something there for a while. But you think of how incredibly blessed we are that we can throw away things that are useful. And I'm not saying don't clean your closet. I'm not saying that at all. But we are amazingly blessed when we can go out and replace an item simply because... We want to replace it. And Solomon says, just be careful that you maintain what God entrusts to you. Why? Because you are a steward. So Solomon says, look, there is something that trumps wealth, that when we give, there's an expression of honor to God and we receive a promise from God. And also fundamental is to recognize that I am a steward. And the last one, very quickly, is a generous God produces generous kids. A generous God. You know, God is so humble in that he says, and this is, I think, do we have this one, Gregory, from chapter 11, verse 24 and 25? Gene cited it, but let's read it together. Chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. Chapter 11, 24 and 25. Let's read it together. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And on the outline, there is the, the, the text from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, 
and he will reward him for what he has done. Isn't that something? He who lends to the poor lends to the Lord. It's utterly amazing, isn't it? And Jesus, building upon that in Matthew chapter 25, as he describes the day of judgment, he says, inasmuch as you've done it for the least of these brothers of mine, you've done it for me. And you think, the only way you and I get to, you know, we, I love the song, you're awesome in this place. And then in, in, the, uh, in the verse, there's lines, as I come into your presence through the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, something, but the word countenance is used. You know, a countenance is just your face, okay? You and I have never seen the face of God. But what you and I think about the face of God is how we treat each other. And what you and I think about the face of God is how we regard those who are in need and how we treat them. That's what he says. He who lends to the poor lends to the Lord. So the only way that you and I have to actually touch God is by touching other people who are created in the image of God. And you know, the most vile person who's the most lost person still bears his image. Why? Because we're created in the image of God and as defiled as that may be by sin, the person that we meet still bears his likeness. But even more so, that is true within the body of Christ as we relate to each other because we bear His recreated image in us. The very image of Jesus Christ is upon us. And so we regard each other in the same way that we would regard Christ. I don't like that. Do you? Because that means that I am not free to love you or not love you. I am not free to be nice to you or not to be nice to you. I am not free to respect you or not to respect you. God does not give me that choice. He says, Keith, the only way that you see my countenance and deal with me is by dealing with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And Keith, did you know this? That in lending and caring for the poor, you are giving and lending to me. That is an incredible challenge. Because a generous God produces generous kids. And these are not simply rules and regulations that spring from the book of Proverbs. As you and I look back at the book of Proverbs from the perspective of the New Testament, we realize that living this life is only possible by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if we are not careful in our days, we will be sucked up into believing that there is nothing that's that trumps wealth. And God says, yes, there is. Wisdom and friendship and a good name surpass the richest person's wealth. That in giving, God says, there is this opportunity that we draw near to Him and express honor and receive a promise from the living God. And that the only way that we ever touch God is by touching each other. That is astounding. And yet it's the basis of fellowship within the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians in chapter, five, chapter 4, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. The only way that we relate to Him meaningfully is by a relationship with each other. Generous God produces generous people. Only Jesus, only Jesus can produce this power of life within us. And our sole motivation in living is that He is our Lord, and we love Him, and we love Him immeasurably. So Proverbs springs to us and brings us into a life of walking wisely with God. If you do not know Him, He wants you to know Him. If you do not know Him, He wants you to trust Him 
and receive his pardon and forgiveness. There is no guilt, no shame that Jesus has not erased by his blood upon the cross. There is no rebellion that he cannot correct. There is no hard heart that he cannot break and cleanse. And he invites us to trust him and him alone is our Savior and our Lord. If you need to talk with someone about Jesus, there are a buku of folk who'd be glad to do so. And if you're ready this day to repent of your sins and be baptized into Christ, heaven says, do it. Heaven says, do it. Do it today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you loved us when we were totally undeserving and totally unlovely. And yet by the work of Christ upon the cross, by his death, his resurrection, his ascension to glory and the promise of his return, you have transformed us into entirely different people. We ask, O oh God, that you would help us walk in the footsteps of Jesus as we meet Jesus daily these couple of months in the book of Proverbs, help us to see Jesus clearly and to walk faithfully. For precious folk, God, who just need to say yes to him because you love each person without limit. Oh, God, please let us not walk away without saying yes to Jesus. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. With the songs we have sung and the words we have heard, we pray that you will leave this morning with a melody in your heart. And if you want to add a second verse to that melody, stick around for Sunday school. <laughs>